Hope you're having a great summit. Uh, you know, as Elon pointed, uh, this is a somewhat selfish way of me making sure I don't get paged. Um, but I'll get to the journey in a little bit. Uh, so I'm Dor, one of the VPs of engineering at Rock. I look after the foundation's uh, tribe, uh, which just probably doesn't mean a lot to you guys. Uh, that's basically consists of SRE, platform engineering, data reliability, security, and toolings. So a bunch of teams that sit under me. Um, so yeah. Jump, jump into a little bit about Rocked. Um, for any of you that doesn't know what Rocked is, um, we basically power um, upsells uh, and uh, e-commerce opportunities across the world. Um, so you can read that out for you if you want, but basically it connects uh, global e-commerce businesses uh, in the moments that matter. Um, so if you think about you know, pre and post transaction opportunities, uh, a lot of businesses you know, sell a singular product or a single element of it, we basically are have an API and a bunch of integrations that allow us to, to upsell in that moment. It's a little bit easier if you just see it this way. Um, so here are some examples of, of you may have come across Rocked in, in your uh, browsing, buying, uh, any opportunities like that. Um, so you'll see us here, both in a native front and more on an offer side. So diving into a little bit about Rocked and what we do. Um, so we're across 6 billion transactions uh, and 17 global markets, uh, and that's great, but I I'm here a little bit to talk about the tech side of things. Um, so we run 25 Kubernetes clusters, I'll refer to as Kates, um, across 2,000 nodes and 20,000 plus containers in production over four regions. Now, getting there, it's growing. It's a lot, it's a lot bigger than when I started in 2019, but so. Why does minimizing the blast radius really matter to us? Um, as I mentioned before, we're integrated in some of the most critical e-commerce transactions uh, in the world uh, on some of the biggest brands. Uh, and so for a range of reasons from obviously, um, you know, increasing revenue and being up for that reason, but also trust. Uh, and trust is something I really want to come back to. When you're integrated in some of these e-commerce transactions, trust is very important. They rely on us to provide upsell opportunities and the last thing they want is you know, I guess a third party coming in and giving a bad performance or a bad experience. So some of the principles I tried to gather for this talk was around what we focus on. Isolation, guardrails, and verification are the three things that we focus on at Rock when we think about minimizing the blast radius. So, you know, what does isolation mean? Um, obviously around size of impact. We want to minimize the change, um, which then plays into the verification that we can measure and, and verify each change that goes out. And then also, how do we protect ourselves if someone um, is trying to do the wrong thing, yeah, even if they're, if they're not meant to? Which happens a lot more than you think. <laughs> Usually get the whoops, which is fine. So, is, actually before I jump into this, just so I get an, uh, another range of the audience, who runs Kate's in production? Hands up. Okay. Who runs it just in general, non-production as well? All right, cool, awesome, just get an idea. This is a little bit biased towards a Kubernetes talk, but anyway. Uh, so is 100% um, reliable, is reliability achievable? And yes, yes, no. Can we achieve 100%? No, general, yes, yep, no, okay. Yes, no, yay. Um, obviously the network isn't reliable, you know, latency between hops isn't zero, bandwidth isn't infinite, there's, you know, technology from the 90s, so hello. So I'm gonna wind you back to, uh, 2019, feels like a while ago. Um, just want to sort of give you a, a lay of the land of what was happening. We had been multi-years into a monolith to, you know, microservices journey, I won't cover into that. We we're all a, also a year into, I think, the Kubernetes journey at that point, or maybe a bit less, actually a few months. Uh, and so we were starting to move a, a few services into Kates. Um, we already had, you know, multi-region capability, we had, um, you know, uh, separation of concerns and a few other things covered in, in print architecture principles that we've carried forward from our existing applications. As I mentioned, we were across four regions. So we thought, you know, deploy Kates, bunch of nodes, what can go wrong? Pretty easy. Um, we thought, oh, okay, we'll just offload the control plane to EKS because, you know, that's also easy. We do run on AWS, by the way. Um, and so, you know, deploy the clusters, everything went well, it was looking good, had all the observability pieces that we thought, deployed an application and then you know, we had two applications, all right, this is around December. And, you know, we started to deploy a platform change. So what we define as a platform change is, you know, anything around node group replacements, anything around, the, you know, the cluster itself, anything around the master control plane, all that stuff. It goes down. 
hurt, really hurt. I will never forget this. <laughs> um, hurt for a lot of reasons. You spend months trying to get you know, a service up, you claim it's more reliable, uh, and, then, and then your application teams come back to you and they go, yeah, but it went down. Um, not fun. What went wrong? We, we got away with that, I guess, in some ways. Uh, reason for that is our application were in split traffic mode, so we could actually fall back to the original implementation on, on VMs. And that was fine. We were, we were able to not actually have a downtime um, in, in some ways and, and save ourselves from a, tra from a custom experience perspective. But obviously, we had lost trust internally from our application teams and, and, and the business and a bunch of other things. So what do we do wrong? Or what could we have done better? Isolation and guardrails. So we thought, you know, being the platform team, it would make sense to have, you know, three AZ support across an individual region, and that would be enough. You know, one-to-one -one mapping of, you know, standard AZ practices. It wasn't really enough. If you're a platform running under an application team, and you want to give more reliability, having an exact guarantee of what the application is guaranteeing to their customer doesn't really make sense. It can work, but it provides some risk. And guardrails, did we have any protection? So when it does happen, when we're doing these node rollouts, did we have any protections that would stop it? No, we just basically rolled out to a whole bunch of regions. So it wasn't really great. Introducing different node groups. So we thought if we split our deployment structure into having different node groups. So if you think about it in the Kubernetes world, you have nodes, nodes, nodes. We separated concerns. So the first thing was to separate platform components. And by platform, I mean you know, the core DNSs and the STOs and all of that. Separate that to our general purpose stuff, which is you know, all of our applications, data, data stores, et cetera. That allowed us to then deploy platform changes at the same time um, as running our applications. And there was sort of no I guess, separation of concerns in some ways. And it also meant we reduced the blast radius to one node group at a time. Works, but still not, not fully there yet. We felt like, you know, how do we give even more guarantee? Because this still meant that we can take down all of the applications here in one go. So we went, okay, let's go a little bit further. Let's introduce what's called cell-based architecture. This was a lot of reading, a lot of research behind a lot of these things. We had a few, few, few ideas within the team. And the idea of cell-based architecture is how do we break down component trees even into smaller blocks, right? So if you think about, you know, if anyone's familiar with availability zones or the equivalent of in other cloud providers, an AZ is there's maybe three or four AZs in a region. How do we break that even further down? So we introduce cells. And so the idea of a cell is that it actually breaks an AZ down into further smaller modular components. And that means that from our perspective, we can now roll out even at a smaller granular piece, right? So, what does that look like together? So, I went through node groups. That's the separation of concerns. We now have cells. So we have what is essentially originally started with, nine, nine AZs. Um, from an application perspective, they're still deploying to one cluster. Under the hood, it's operating as nine. And so that's how we started to get uh, a bit more guarantee, I guess. And this allowed us to actually test changes. So we can deploy into a single cell in a single region, a single AZ, in a single subzone, and test a very small change in production and have very minimal um, impact, which meant that we not only can get the guarantee of production traffic and look at those um, metrics and things like that, but also be able to test in a very small environment. Now, one of the drawbacks of this, as you can imagine, is it's a lot slower rollout because now you've got so many cells to roll everything out. So it fixed, we're happy with the trade-off, life was good. It meant that we can now deploy platform changes under the application teams and have zero downtime, zero impact, everything else. Well, it worked. Now, I'm gonna fast forward a little bit. It's about a year in. At this point, we had mostly about 99% of our services running on Kates, uh, again, across the four regions. We had the cell-based architecture, the node groups. But we started to see something called, what we define as deployment drift. Now, I don't know what the game is when you're a kid, but you sort of you hit the little thing that pops up and then they keep popping up and you keep hitting it. So that's, imagine that game. Except it happens with pods because you're now rolling cells out. What happens is you go, it goes from one cell to another cell and then 
that cell gets terminated and it ends up here. So now as an application team, you're near, now you've got the problem of, oh, I was running fine. Oh, I've been terminated. Oh, I'm moving again. What is the platform team doing and why? <laughs> so this is fine. To be honest, for the most part, we actually didn't notice because stateless services can deal with it at, um, with this sort of, I guess, annoyance uh, at Rocked. But we started doing a lot more um, stateful services. So things like Kafka and, and data stores and things like that. Noticed it a lot more with them. Um, Kafka is not really friendly if you just keep terminating it region after region, AZ after AZ. So how do we solve this? No group isolation. Um, so what we did was we introduced some tooling that allowed us to then use a cell-based architecture and the no group ID and actually cordon entire sets of pods and nodes out. So we we're able to now spin up a whole new node set and actually get pods to move over and cordon it. Um, these tools have been pretty, pretty useful for us because uh, not only do we use it in, in when we do a rollout, so if you imagine, you know, isolate an SL, new cell comes up, all the pods go, traffic goes automatically. We actually use it as an incident management. So if they ever have an issue with AZ, performance, anything, we can isolate a whole cell, AZ, region, et cetera. Fixed. Works well. So then we keep going. We're now about one and a half years in. I think this is our second Black Friday, Side Monday at this point. Um, we normally see about 2x traffic. So you can imagine when we're integrated with all these e-commerce websites around the world, obviously that's a big day for them. It's also a bigger day for us. Uh, and we started seeing some issues around scale up. So we normally do a couple of things around getting prepared, like pre-warm, bring up a few more capacity instances, et cetera. Ran out of instances, wasn't fun. So we're trying to do a warm up just like everybody else in said cloud provider. We ran out of instances and we introduced instance fallback. Um, I think this is now supported in um, an auto scaling group configuration, but back in the day it wasn't. Um, and this is basically where ability to, for us to fall back on primary and secondary instances when we need to. So if we run out of capacity, we can go back and forth between them. So you can start to see a pattern. We've got the cell base, the node groups, the instance fallback, constantly trying to reduce that blast radius all the time. We're really thinking about when something goes wrong, how do we impact? How do we at least reduce that impact? Awesome, fixed, yay. So after three years, it's been, been about three years, um, we deploy thousands, I put thousands actually technically two point something, one X or something changes per day that rolls out. So when I mean roll out, we're rolling 2000 nodes across the world all the time. Um, even right now, I think there's a few deployments going out. Um, tooling that basically auto manages the rollouts. Um, so that's the tooling I mentioned before that helps speed it up. As I said, one of the drawbacks of this whole cell base was that it would mean that modular rollouts would happen. It would be a lot slower. The team would spend more time looking at it. Not fun. So I actually added some tooling that automatically goes into Datadog, looks at all the metrics, looks at a cell, looks at the next cell, looks at the AZ, compares it, uh, and compares all of the, the, you know, the average, the max, the latency, everything else. And um, we've actually started extending cell based across all of our applications and things like that. One of the great things is a sleep in peace. <laughs> um, it really has been good, to be honest. Uh, we have had incidents, no, I won't lie, but it's been at a, such a small level. Um, even recently, we tried to roll out a new instance type, um, which is meant to have better performance, but in our environment, actually didn't. And we found out in one cell, and you can actually see. So, I spoke about platform. What do we do for applications to minimize the blast radius? Canary deployments is one of them. Um, so we want, again, consistently reduce that blast radius. So you get the theme of this. How do we make sure that even our applications when releasing have absolutely minimal impact when going out? We do, we're pretty extensively, uh, extensively use Canary deployments uh, across all of our applications. Um, so if you imagine, you know, 20% of traffic goes into a new, new um, version. Uh, and then we do some testing, releases the next 20, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and again, this, this can be controlled at both an AZ level, region level, global level. Um, so, you know, when applications are rolling out, they roll out to a specific cell region, et cetera. We also have other tools that help us. Um, so everything from our, you know, regional deployments to visual regression tools, end-to-end -to -end tools. Um, and a lot of this is to be phased is also before and after 
release to help us give us that confidence that our customers are not impacting. And continually tune metrics and alerting. Um, it's something that's really understated in this. Um, we spend a lot, a lot of time <coughs> tuning metrics, alerts. So what does this really mean to you? So the idea of this is like in, for us, we, we started the thought process around going towards that 100% perfect availability as a business. And one of the things is that that's, you know, in our opinion, it's quite hard to achieve just because you don't control the absolute end-to-end. -end. And so for us, we thought about how do we minimize the, the blast radius. And as a result, you sort of, I guess, increase that um, availability and reliability. And so a lot of the times we think about when deploying, when thinking about um, you know, how we run, how we structure our you know, application, platform, data stores, you name it. It's all about minimizing that, that blast radius, making sure that cell or that individual component when you're deploying or making a change can be tested against that live version, but at a very small subset. Um, and this helps us because when we're in incidents, it helps us understand because we've engineered in a way that this is practice. We expect it to go down. We expect something to happen. So when we're in incidents, we have the tooling, we have everything. This runs in our CI on a day-to-day -day basis. This runs, we all have it in our, on our laptops. We know when this happens, this is what we're gonna do. So when, it's not a surprise that when we don't reach 100% reliability, we go, oh God, what do we do now? The other thing is, is looking at the design principles. Obviously, this is one way of doing it. Um, it works for us. Uh, it's, our, it's, it's just one of those ways where we were able to look at cost-benefit analysis of you know, how do we architect our systems, our business, uh, and looping back to that is, as I said, when you integrate in that e-commerce space, trust and, and resiliency is, is incredibly important because you, know, you don't want a, a major e-commerce business coming to you and being like, oh, you said you're reliable, but you went down for 10 minutes. Not great. So that sort of covers everything. Obviously, we're hiring. <laughs> Um, but yeah, look, obviously we have had an incredible journey across understanding reliability and thinking about it at our scale. Uh, it's been very interesting, thanks to my team. Um, obviously, if you want to join us, that's there. Um, but thank you.